business of uh, introducing Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev, who's been described in many different ways in my profession by people from my profession. We've called you a maverick. <laughs> We've called you a monk on a motorcycle. We've called you a glamorous, flamboyant guru. But for your devotees, you are simply Sadhguru. And yet, uh, Sadhguru, at a time when faith seems to be in collision with so many other questions that come up as a matter of individual liberty, I think this will make for a very interesting and important conversation for our time. So I would like to thank you for being part of this conversation. And let me start with the spiritual. And I hope what you say today is also addressed to the skeptics. I count myself among a skeptic who, if told that another human being possesses some sort of godly power, I would perhaps, as the first instinct, not believe it. But what I find interesting about what you've, some of your sayings is captured by Aruthati Subramaniam in this book is that you're actually saying that what we experience beyond our five senses, anything that we experience beyond the five senses can be called God, can be called power, or can be called yourself. So if God doesn't necessarily exist, why do we need gurus? Why do we need Sadhguru? <laughs> Is there a my microphone? Okay, that's good. <laughs> do you drive in Delhi? Do I drive? Mm -hmm. Unlike you, <laughs> I have a fear of wheels. <laughs> so if you drive in an unknown terrain, yes. you use uh, these days a GPS. Yes. Usually a strange woman will tell you, turn right, you yes. turn right. She says, turn left, you say, turn left. She says, make a U-turn, you make a U-turn. Why? Simply because you're… you're not familiar with the terrain. When you're in an unfamiliar terrain, it is sensible to take instructions. So, are you… are you saying gurus are the new GPS? Not you, <laughs> not new. Long time ago we've been, <laughs> for a very long time, way before the GPS came. GPS means what? Guru positioning system <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I have to say that while I don't drive, I've often sat in a car and heard that girl's voice on Google Maps. And often Google Maps does actually, not… does you not can actually, give you the right advice. You can change it to your man's voice if you wish. Okay. <laughs> beginning of this conversation perhaps underlines that you are atypical. You are atypical of what we imagine gurus to be. We expect people who don't crack jokes. We expect people who don't have a zest for life. Somehow all of our spirituality has traditionally been centered around giving up, around abstinence of some kind, abstaining from pleasures, from denying creature comforts. Why do you believe that the material can coexist with the spiritual? It's… it's not that I believe, it's only because you have a body which is your physicality. Yes. You have a life with it. If you did not have a body, if you're disembodied, I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> yes. Because uh, with disembodied beings you don't have conversations, okay? Mm. I know people… People do talk to ghosts. People are trying to do that these days. Yes. <laughs> Because they're not in talking terms with the living, <laughs> they choose the dead. <laughs> because you can make the dead speak whatever you want. The living will speak what they want, yeah. it's yeah. a big problem. <laughs> it's a very serious problem in a conversation <laughs> because I will say what I want to say. But if I was dead, you can make me say whatever you want to say. Hmm. But can an… Because you can do both sides of the conversation. But if your philosophy, or you hate the word philosophy, I know, if your technology of inner engineering, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment, is available to all of us to, in a sense, find strength within ourselves, Sadhguru, then does that mean that the atheist and the agnostic and the skeptic can also embrace spirituality? Is inner engineering only for those who believe, or is it for anyone who <laughs> asks questions? <laughs> The previous question is a loaded one, still not answered fully. Yes, I know, I haven't… <laughs> I haven't given up on it yet. Coming to this, uh, 
See, you're putting atheists and agnostics and skeptics together, it's a wrong classification. Atheists and thieves are together, they're one kind. Because they both have certainty? Both… both believe something that they do not know. Both are not sincere enough to admit that they do not know. Yes. This is the biggest problem. The biggest problem in the world is people are still not straight enough to come to a place, what I know, I know, what I do not know, I do not know. Because they have not realized the immensity of I do not know. I do not know is the basis of longing to know and seeking to know and the possibility of knowing. The moment you destroy I do not know, you destroyed all possibilities of knowing. So this is atheism and this is theism. They're not different. They're in the same boat, they pretend to be different. One believes positively, another believes negatively, but they both believe something that they do not know. One uh, person, a well-known person in the country who goes about claiming he's an atheist all the time, one day comes up to me, somebody just introduces me first time. I say, Namaste. He says, do you know I believe there is no God? I said, I don't even believe that. Do you mean Javed Akhtar? <laughs> I, I'm not… No, that was a… That was a, that was a good imitation, so I guess it wasn't difficult. <laughs> I'm not taking names, I'm saying… The thing is, you also believe something, you don't seem to understand that. Yes. The most important thing is to come to this place of being utterly straight and sincere with life. What I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. If you come to this much, if you closely pay attention to everything around you, you will see with all this scientific exploration, we do not know even a single atom in its entirety, that's a fact. So what is it that you know, Sadhguru? <laughs> Why are millions of people your devotees, because you just said that honesty is about, is about… They usually don't… They don't claim that they're my devotees. What you know? do they say then? Huh? What do they say then? Usually they claim they're merit eaters, volunteers and stuff. Okay, <laughs> volunteers then. <laughs> but there must be something they think that you know, because you just said that life is actually about admitting what you don't know. The corollary to that is there are things that you do know. We do know we are sitting at the Habitat Center Amphitheater at this moment in Delhi. That we know. What beyond this, Sadhguru, do you know and what do you not know? <laughs> I've asked you like in the question of more existence now <laughs> <laughs> What do I know? I don't know anything except this one. I know this piece of life from its origin to its ultimate. Everything that I need to know about this life, I know. And I see every other life, is actually the same thing if you look deep enough. So in that context, because today modern science is coming to this, there is a, a theory which is evolving, which is called as constructional theory. Mm. What they are beginning to say is, whether it's an amoeba or a grasshopper or a earthworm or a bird or an animal or an elephant or you or me, or the whole cosmos, the fundamental design is same. It is only a question of complexities and sophistication of the same design. Mm. So this is something always the yogic science has been saying, that if you know, you know anda, you know pindanda, <laughs> you know, if you know the atomic, you know the cosmic, because the fundamental design is same, it's only a question of complexity and sophistication of what's happening. Mm. So fundamentally, if you know this piece of life, you know everything by inference. But when you say this piece of life, do you mean yourself? Do you mean this moment? What do you mean by this piece of life? You are a piece of life, aren't you? Are you life or are you, are you media? <laughs> are they mutually exclusive? No, no, because people have mediums, that's why I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would hope I'm a flesh and blood person, unless somebody knows better. Flesh and blood you gather. Yes. Isn't it? Yes. What you call is my flesh and blood, you slowly gathered over a period of time. If this much accumulation of flesh and blood, this much impressions have to be gathered, there must be something more fundamental, isn't it? Do you think of yourself as a yogi, a mystic or a guru? I have not wasted time thinking about myself. 
What would you rather be thinking of? I don't think usually, really. For me, uh, see th this whole thing, because of the type of very mediocre education that's being delivered today, mm. we have raised thought to heaven, unfortunately. Mm. Thought is a simple thing. I know this is uh, against everything that you believe in, because you're also a believer <laughs> No. Believer in thought. Yeah, I this... believe in, in, in being able to ask questions, that's what yes. I do for a living. Oh. <laughs> So I, must, so, I must believe that it is possible to you, ask questions. You ask questions for a living, my life is full of questions <laughs> Now, now the thing is, what you call as thought is coming from the limited data that you have gathered from the experience of your life. Every person is the same thing. How much ever we have gathered, it's still too small compared to the size of this cosmos and the way the phenomena of life is happening. From this limited da data, you can recycle things and generate thought. Or in other words, nothing new ever happens. Hmm. Same permutations and combinations of the same thing will go on forever. The essence of what we're teaching in the name of… in engineering is, to engineer yourself in such a way, every moment of your life is a new possibility. If it has to become a new possibility, what is needed is perception. When I say perception, people think opinions. No, I'm talking about perception as you see here. Similarly, enhancing your perception so that you perceive life. Right now when we say thought, emotion, we are talking about expressing life. Mm. Expression is not so important. Once in a way, we can express. But perceiving it is important because this phenomena is too fantastic. Mm. It's not a small thing. The greatest phenomena that's happening here is life itself. Mm. So. If you want to know this phenomena, the only way you can know, the only doorway for you to know life is yourself. See, right now, can you see me? Yes. I can. Can you… can you use a finger and point out where I am? Oh, you're wrong. You know, I'm a mystic from South India <laughs> <laughs> Now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, you know the whole story. Where do you see me now? Still in the same place? No. I do. You see me the way I'm projected in the firmament of your mind. You cannot see me here in the very nature of your visual apparatus. Hmm. Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself. Where have you seen the whole world? Within yourself. Now if there is a grasshopper here, he doesn't see me the way you see me. He sees me differently. He sees the whole world differently. Now you… you can think, oh, he is no good. This is the fundamental problem that we think his perception is no good. No, no, his perception is very good for his survival. Your perception is very good for your survival, but it's not good enough to know the nature of life. Hmm. But I… So now, what do I know means, I have enhanced… enhanced my perception the way it is important to know the nature of life, not just for survival. But if in inner engineering as a spiritual technology is something that works, I ask you again, why do we need gurus? Because that means the answers are within us. You're speaking so much language. Did you learn A, B, C, D, all I, those things? I think so. Do you remember when you were four years of age, that damn A, how complicated it was? Yes. There's two versions to it. You had to write it a hundred times to get the damn A. Today you can close your eyes and write. So it doesn't matter how simple something is, without a certain guidance, could you have picked up A, B, C, I'm asking? No. Similarly, when something new you have to approach, if you don't have the right kind of guidance, you won't pick it up. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Your story is well chronicled, but what is of interest to people is that you started off as… I haven't read that book, I don't know, I hope she's written nice things about she's, it. She's written a very brilliant… Arundhati uh, Supramaniam has written a very brilliant, very brilliant no, book. she's brilliant, but what's she written about me? I... <laughs> One of the things that she has said is that you give great space for dissent. You like a good argument, that you're not… A, you're not one of those dictatorial gurus. <laughs> I don't know where is a dictatorial guru. I think the, most people have not met a guru, they've just seen calendar images and made conclusions. I don't think they've met any genuine guru. 
There are a whole lot of people who should have been temple priests who are good entrepreneurs and they've become gurus today. That's different, okay? Mm. Temple priests no, no, who saying, have become good entrepreneurs. No, I'm saying… It's just another word of… A way of saying they're charlatans. That's a strong word. Maybe that's enterprise. I'm not an enterprise. Mm. So because I'm not an enterprise, I want everybody to ask whatever the damn question they have, it doesn't matter how ridiculous or how intelligent, how nonsensical it is, it doesn't matter. If the question means something to you, it means something to me. It doesn't matter how brilliant it is, if it doesn't mean anything to you, I'm not willing to listen to it. Mm. But you're saying that many, many people are, uh, who are positioning themselves as gurus are really only elevating themselves and fooling people. I've… I've… No, of... <laughs> I didn't say okay, that. Okay, I'm saying that. I, I'm uh, saying… Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the but... thing is, there is a vacuum, somebody is trying to fill it. Yes, and Sadhguru, you have Are been... they qualified to be that? Questionable thing. But a, a very genuine concern, and you have been on some of my television programs where we have spoken about this, is whether God men are often con men. And how does this lady here know the difference between who's a godman and who's a conman and is a human being capable of being a godman? Do you think of yourself as a godman? <laughs> Why are you underestimating that lady <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let it be my question. How do I spot the difference between a godman and a conman if I don't even believe that humans can be godly. I think humans can be brave and wonderful and inspiring and… but I don't think that they have magical powers. See, uh, did you ever see God having magical powers? No, I've never seen God. No, then why are you saying he must have magical powers <laughs> So first of all, this Godman is essentially a media coined word. Nobody claims that he's a God-man, okay? Some are goddamn men. That's different <laughs> Nobody, I don't think anybody has personally claimed I'm a God-man. <laughs> I have not met anybody like that. Now, uh, that is a… that's another kind of profession, putting labels on everybody, you know. <laughs> Leaving that alone, what is it? This is a culture, you must understand, this is unfortunately all mixed up today. This is a godless culture, you must understand this. There has never been an idea of a god in this culture. Only in competition with what came from outside, because we saw they could rule us, they were dominant, and we thought we have to imitate their ways, we also started making it up to some extent, not successfully though. Yes, but we know the technology of god-making. When I say technology, we're using the English word God, but that word doesn't exist in India. Here we call them devas. What a deva means is… See, today media is projecting Tendulkar as a cricketing god. It's very appropriate to this culture because if somebody excels beyond a certain level in any field, he may be a sports person, he may be a warrior, he may be an artist, he may be anything, if he excels, beyond what normally average human beings think is possible for them. He goes, they recognized him as a deva and he is worth looking up to because he becomes a guiding light for them. That will anyway happen, whether you like it, you believe it, you don't sure. believe it, in every field sure. somebody rises, he becomes the light for the rest of the people. Yes. So similarly in the inner spaces, when I say the inner spaces, the quality of your life is not determined by what kind of house you live in, what clothes you wear, what car you parked outside, what things jing-bang happening around you, no. This moment, how joyful, peaceful, blissed out you are within yourself. Now if I sit here, we are sitting here in the same space, breathing the same air, probably we ate the same kind of food. I don't know what you eat. Uh, but if I sit here now with my eyes closed, the way I am within myself, I will not exchange this for anything in the universe. Now, when people see no matter the number of things I'm managing is insane. Everybody thinks, Sadhguru, is it possible you must go crazy someday? Yeah. All volunteers, over three million volunteers, enterprises, businesses, okay, projects, mega projects on the street, all kinds of activity going around around the globe. 
if anybody has to go nuts, it's me, okay? Because all run by volunteers. Run by volunteers means nobody is trained for the job and you can't fire them for inefficiency because they're volunteers, <laughs> all right? And any time they come in, any time and do great things, any time they'll walk away, all right? And nothing should collapse. Till now, I must tell you this, as we are sitting here, this day, probably little over three hundred and odd programs in engineering programs are happening in the world. Never in the last thirty-three years, one program has been abandoned or has failed. That… that takes enormous management, but nobody will ever see me getting angry or miserable or tensed out or stressed out. You've never lost your temper? You want me to know? <laughs> Do I look like I'm incapable of that? It's not that, it's not that I'm incapable of anger, it's just that I've never given the privilege to anybody. I have not given this privilege to anybody, they can make me happy, they can make me unhappy, they can make me angry, they can make me miserable, no. I kept these privileges to myself. So, people, you were talking about miracles or whatever, people ask me, Sadhguru, everybody in every ashram, miracles are happening. Mm. You are beating all the miracles down, if we say something mm. happened, mm. you make us look like fools. Mm. No miracle. I say, what, you want me to pull a pigeon out of my pocket? <laughs> If I pull but a pigeon… But there are… No, if I… Gurus <laughs> if who I came <laughs> to do that, who have been challenged by rationalists. I'll come to this. If I pull a pigeon out of my pocket, I have a shitty pocket <laughs> and you have a bird <laughs> what are you going to do with this? You come to me, I will show you the miracle. I have thousands of people who are working seven days a week, sixteen to eighteen days… eighteen hours every day. In the last two, five, ten years, not a single moment of irritation, agitation, anger in their life. This is a miracle. This is a miracle we want to manifest. You don't want a miracle? You I agree, this is a miracle. Yes. And not that pigeon. Do you have a pigeon in your pocket? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I don't like a shitty I know, pocket. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> now, you were thirteen. In, in, in Arundhati's book, I read that you were thirteen when you first quite accidentally discovered yoga. You were children playing in, in, at the bottom of a well. That's, that's what the book says. Tell us, how did you discover yoga? Oh. <laughs> uh, I told that because that's how it happened to me. I said that to her. I don't know how she's written, I've not read it. Uh, I said that to her because I want people to understand the nature of the universe is, even if you do for the wrong reasons, you do the right thing, still it works. If you do the wrong thing, even for the right reasons, it still doesn't work. People need to understand this because the whole world has invested on goodness. The goddamn goodness is killing the world. There are too many good people and these good people are the biggest problem. It's always a good Indian who wants to fight a good Pakistani, good Hindu wants to fight a good Muslim, good American wants to fight with just about anybody <laughs> The more good you are, the more fighting you are. The more good you think you are because goodness is always in comparison… Don't, don't, don't forget the good journalists who pro promote these uh, fighting uh, every day on channels <laughs> Because your goodness comes by comparing yourself to somebody. If you were alone on this planet, you wouldn't know whether you're good or bad. What we need on this planet is sensible human beings. Little more sense we could do with, isn't it, for sure, in every aspect of life. Engineering essentially means you could have built this structure whichever way you want, but you will have to keep looking up when it's going to crash on your head. Engineering means you put it up in a sensible manner, the way it stays without anxiety about it. Similarly, inner engineering means you engineered yourself in such a way, you can go through the process of life without being anxious about your suffering. What will happen to me? There's no such thing because you engineer yourself well. Whatever the hell happens around you, if hmm. within yourself, you are the same thing. So every time I launch one mega project, you'll say, Sadhguru, if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, what? It doesn't work, what? If everything that I am doing, if nothing works, I will still die blissfully. This is guaranteed. 
I want to make sure it's guaranteed for every human being so that they can live their life without the fear of suffering. Right now, instead of seeing how suffering should go, people are busy romanticizing suffering. The moment you romanticize suffering, it's very clear, you are not interested in human well-being. You like drama. Hmm. You've often spoke about how economic leaders are going to be the future of the world, you've been interacting with CEOs. It's rare to find a spiritual guru who's also quite openly capitalistic. Are you a capitalist? What is that? Who believes that wealth creation is for the greater good <laughs> of people and society? See, a whole lot of people are attached to poverty right now. Because without poor people, without hungry people, they cannot survive. I am not one of those. I want to see that six hundred million people on, in this country are postponing their dinner tonight. But we are postponing major decisions in the parliament every day, hmm. all right? I am not a part of that. I want things to happen because I know what it means to postpone a dinner. I don't want that to happen to pe people. Children are postponing their dinner tonight. Probably a hundred million children in this country have postponed their dinner to tomorrow and that's not a joke. So, these jokers who identify themselves with this or that are going on playing their joke on the people every day. So, Capitalism is an ancient word, it no more exists. We are talking about a market economy. When only a few families had access to capital, it was capitalism. It is no more capitalism. If you have a good idea and you know how to execute it, there is capital for everyone, all right? So, we have tried communism. It's a wonderful idea, but that must happen willingly. If you enforce it, it's the ugliest thing. We have seen it, we have seen a major demo on the planet, you know, most ugly things happen, you try to enforce it. Karl Marx might have known lot about economy. You know, I was… Uh, when I was fifteen, I was all gung-ho about Engels and Karl Marx and stuff. But he did not understand human nature. I realized that when I was sixteen, thirteen, fourteen, I was all fired up, reading up all the communist literature from Russia <laughs> But by the time I was sixteen, I realized these people don't understand what is human aspiration. Hmm. Without understanding what's human aspiration, you try to build a society, you try to build a nation, it's a disaster, okay, cruel disaster. But maybe it will work when really a country or a society is in, in total dumps, you have to force it out. Hmm. When you have to force it out, it works but after that it won't work. In a way, if you come to the ashram, nearly four thousand people are living in the ashram, well, you can say it's communist, but by willingness, it's not by, okay, I did so much, so I get so much, no. Everybody gets what they need. So this is not enforced, this is by choice. If by choice you are willing to share, how fantastic it is. But I have nothing, you have something, I want you to share, how ugly it is. What is it with Sadhguru and motorcycles? These days I'm on four wheels. <laughs> but you haven't given up your love for bikes <laughs> or have you? It's just that when I was… I started, uh, you know, trekking in the jungles when I was ten, eleven, I would be gone. If I had ten rupees in my pocket, I would organize my food and I'm gone with this little note in the house. I can imagine my parents… Uh, <laughs> I, I always wished I shouldn't have a boy ever. <laughs> Girls can run away too on bikes. Uh, they run later <laughs> <laughs> They don't run at ten, eleven, okay <laughs> And they're on a pillion, they're usually pillion. And if they find a good rider, no problem <laughs> I'm saying, the thing was, it's not about the motorcycle or this or that, it is just that I was a cloud of million questions all the time. And wherever I looked, nobody had a sensible answer. Everybody has standard answers that they've heard from somewhere. Nobody has a genuine experiential answer. So, there's a restlessness to explore just about anything. When I was ten, eleven years of age, I would be gone into the forest for three, four days. Once food ran out and I couldn't survive there, I would come back. So, initially lot of excitement, but later on they kind of settled down, they knew 
I'll get back. So when I became fourteen, fifteen, I cycled across South India. Not because I am a cycling enthusiast, not like today wearing a helmet and suited, booted for cycling, no. Simply I cycle because cycling is little faster than walking. The moment I became seventeen, I still didn't have a license but I found a motor to my cycle, which mm. became a motorcycle. <laughs> So that because it went little faster, mm. it… it supported my restlessness to know something, I didn't even know what the hell it is. Mm. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I had questions about anything I looked at. Everything in the universe looked like a question mark to me. Mm -hmm. But the… the question about the motorcycle is really to ask whether the motorcycle, the Land Rover or Land Cruiser, which one is it now? Land Rover, Land Cruiser, I'm not sure. But whatever, the four wheels, the helicopter. You, I think you once said somewhere that I like… Uh, that whether… if it moves on land, water or air, I, I like it. Uh, this is not… one thing is I like anything that works and machines work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The more efficiently work, the better they are. And uh, why it's important is, after all, what is the quality of an individual human being? How smoothly and how efficiently your body, mind and everything functions is the quality of a human being, isn't it? Mm. So machines always excited me, whether it's a bicycle or mm. motorcycle or uh, because of, you know, lack of the necessary, probably the fitness that I was at that time, I crisscrossed India mm. on the motorcycle, today it would be hard, so mm. you can do something little more comfortable. But you know, while that makes you a very interesting character to observe, did you ever worry that you'd be labelled or dubbed a richy rich person's guru? Uh, this is, you know, this is the Sadhguru who see, flies his own planes, is, who no, likes no. his BMW, who likes his game of golf, who likes having a no. little frisbee match Let's, on let's come to that. <laughs> See, the thing is, uh, I would… I wouldn't mind, I even… sometimes we… Uh, I… I ride a bullock cart, nobody reports that <laughs> I, I… I love to handle the bulls and I… I still drive them sometimes. But now uh, you… I want to have a conversation with you. This afternoon till two o'clock, I was in Jodhpur. Yes. I could have come by a bullock cart or a camel cart. <laughs> you had to wait for five days. <laughs> I came one time, you must appreciate that. So it's about efficiency is what you're saying? Yes. So I le I personally learned to fly a helicopter where I don't have the time for these things but I somehow fit in this and learned because seventy percent of our work is in rural India. I thought this little helicopter could just… I could set the place on fire because I'm half the time stuck, half my life I'm on the road stuck in some traffic hmm. driving myself all the time behind huge… everywhere, there's no place in the country where there's no traffic jams. Believe me, even in rural India, there are traffic jams. So I thought a helicopter would really revolutionize our work. I picked up the thing, I got my license, FAA license, but in India it's so difficult to get the license because many of these rules were made before Wright brothers came. Hmm. Well, according to some, the plane was also made before the Wright brothers <laughs> came. <laughs> and they say it was made in the Vedic ages. Mm, they're not they're very wrong. Conceptually, it was made. Whether physically they're built or not, we don't have proof for that. Conceptually, Conceptually, no it's about imagination, to no, think no, that you can no, move no, from no. place A to place B. No, no, no. You cannot conceptually imagine something entirely. Even if you imagine, you must be able to produce some… you must understand the principles in some way as to why something flies. Yeah. If you don't understand why something flies, it'll be like that, uh, you know, once it happened, a little turtle very… with great effort climbed a tree, went to the edge of a branch and jumped, fell flat, lot of pain. Slowly again he crawled up in another two days, again up, jumped, fell down, again up, fell down. After a few days, two birds were sitting on the opposite tree. They were talking and they said, I think it's time we tell him he's adopted <laughs> All right. So I'm saying, what cannot fly, you cannot make it fly. Yes. People thought in detail as to what can fly, what cannot fly. Conceptually they thought, whether they built or not, we don't know. And 
is it… is it… I mean, it is an established fact they calculate the speed of light. Somebody, some individual cannot calculate the speed of light just like that if there was no whole scientific culture around him. Mm. No individual will just drop from heaven and calculate the speed of light, okay? There must have been a scientific culture, otherwise it won't happen. Mm. But we need to understand, there is a difference between science and technology. But there's also a difference between science and mythology. Some things are just great stories, that doesn't mean they actually happened. See, for example, there are… there are uh, images or there are uh, sketches which show… which probably somewhere between three to four thousand years ago were made, where it clearly shows a turtle and a round planet sitting on it and going around. Turtle is the best example, best analogy for a planetary movement because a turtle cannot accelerate. Hmm. <laughs> Sim same speed, he just keeps going. So a round planet on a turtle is the best way to describe how a planet moves around. And the very word for geography in this country is bughol, which means it's a round planet. So it is not because of Galileo we know it's a round planet, we have always known. How do we know? We can't know just one scientific fact and not know the other aspects related to it. So this thing about anything Indian beating it down is because one thing is that culture has evolved because half the people, their brains are in Greenwich Mean Time. They've still not gotten out of the 1948, whatever happened. We struggled for independence, we came out, not just to send them out, but to be who we are. So, that problem is still there. And now there are upstarts who claim all kinds of things. There has to be an even balance, not beating down this or pumping it up in an unrealistic way. But you cannot deny Indian mind has thought about things that nobody had thought about in those times. Mm. There is no question about that. Mm. But there is a distinction between science and technology. Science can evolve because of certain intelligence. Technology needs material manifestation. Mm. Now we are trying to claim technology, which we should not. If we just focus on science, many things will be attributed to India for sure. We live in times when faith and spirituality have become very inflammable. Don't put them in the same basket. Okay, let's talk about faith first. Mm -hmm. We live in times when faith for certain has become a very inflammable, easily politicized conversation. If faith should have been personal today, it's not. Today you actually have decisions taken in the name of somebody's faith being injured. So. You mentioned food right now. I read somewhere that you said there's nothing religious about the act of food, just eat what you like. No, 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 I didn't say that. Eat what's good for you? I said eat what's good okay, for you. Okay, eat what's good for it's you. It's a very different thing. Okay, I correct myself. <laughs> eat what's good for you. But today we have a highly politicized conversation around banning beef in the name of faith. It's definitely ha not good for you to eat it. Beef or any meat? I'll come to that. Finish okay, the, finish the okay. so I'm offering that as one example of how I see a politicized conversation taking place around faith. How do you reconcile the faith of a large number of people with questions of individual liberty? I know I have read that you like books written by Salman Rushdie. We were the first country to ban him again in the name of faith. How do we reconcile faith with individual liberty? See, uh, it's always been said, uh, faith moves mountains. Yes, but it freezes your mind. But the greatest crime you can do on this planet is to move a mountain. You should not move a mountain, it should be where it is. It is not just dropped from somewhere, it's grown because of various forces functioning in a particular way. Phenomenal activity has happened to build a mountain. You should never move a mountain. But <laughs> people with frozen minds always want to move a mountain, okay? Having said that, when we say faith, it's an import for this culture. We have never had faith in this culture. You must look back little beyond thousand years since we've been under occupation. Here we have been told always, your life is your karma. Karma means action. Whose action? Your action. <coughs> so what we are saying is your life is entirely your making. There is no someone sitting up there and managing this for you. This is entirely yours. But 
For every action that you perform, whether physical, mental, emotional, energy-wise, whatever kind of action you perform, there is bound to be a consequence. If you're ready for the consequence, do whatever. If you're going to cry about the consequence, control the action right now. Based on this, now you came to food. See, the food consumption has been looked at very carefully in this country. If you just bring this back, the world will be healthy, do you understand? Mm. Here we have identified different type of people, what they should eat. If you're doing menial jobs, how you should eat. If you're doing trading, how you should eat. If you're into spiritual process, how you should eat. If you're into education, how you should eat. Why this is, is each person needs a different type of building of the body. You want to run hundred meters uh, next to Mr. Bolt, what kind of food you should eat? You just want to work in Delhi, what kind of food you should eat? You want to think in a certain way, what kind of food you, you should eat? For all these, we have very clear prescriptions. Now, when it comes to food, what it means is, we are taking another life, whatever that is, it may be plant life, animal life, whatever. You're taking another life, ingesting it, and you have to make it your life, that's a whole thing. What is your life, what is that life, if you look at it? All life on this planet is coming from the earth. This body is also the same soil, this is also same soil, if there is an earthworm, that is also same soil. But see how it has become, how this has become, how that has become. If I give you… you like a mango or a banana? Mango. Mango. <laughs> I know, you're, you're ruling the state right now <laughs> Now, if you eat a, ma a mango, this mango becomes a woman in you. If I eat a mango, the same mango becomes a man in me. If a cow eats a mango, the same mango becomes a cow in the cow. Why is this happening? There is a certain information or software in you, whatever you eat, it transforms it into a woman. If I eat, it transforms it to a man. If a cow eats, that becomes a cow. So, every life is happening the way it is happening because of a certain dimension of information or in modern terminology, let's call it software. There mm. is a certain software, mm. which is an arrangement of information. Mm. Now, the idea is to eat as simple a software as possible. If you eat that kind of life, which is a very simple software, your ability to override that software and make it entirely a part of you is very good. As that software gets com complex, more yes. and more complex, yes. your ability to integrate it goes down. So especially if it's a creature which has some sense of thought and emotion, if it has emotion, then you should not eat it. This is the understanding. Mm. An animal which has any emotion, displays certain emotions, especially if it displays emotion which is near to human emotion, you should not eat it because it will not integrate itself, that animal nature will start manifesting itself. Or in other words, in India, today maybe in cities people do not know, you see in the villages, people have very intimate relationship with the cow. They have drunk the milk of that cow, their children are drinking the milk of that cow, there is a very deep relationship, if you do not know this, Cow is one creature, if something happens to you and you are in some kind of grief or misery, you don't have to be near the cow. Wherever the cow is in your house, it will st it'll start shedding tears for you. Mm. You know, I've seen this with my eyes, I couldn't believe. When somebody is dead in the house, it… what does a cow know? It is somewhere, simply tears flowing. So when it has such deep emotions, if you kill it, it's like killing a human being, it's murder or it's cannibalism. So because of that, this is not a faith thing, mm. this is not a religious thing. We thought this is a fundamental sense. Why… You see, when we are hungry, why can't I cut you up and eat you? What's wrong? What's wrong but what, about… But what you're saying should be about many more animals than just the yes, cow. Yes, yes of course. And when it becomes about only the cow, then there is a… there is certainly a perception it, it is not that it is a political decision or a religious decision. No, no, I'm not talking about the… whatever the laws… This is not about a people getting up and saying it's cruel to be… to be a meat eater. That… that would be a different argument. Mm, I'm not even talking about cruelty, even cutting a plant is cruel in my experience. Mm. But you have to do it. But if you're conscious of it, you will do it to the minimum possible extent, not do it wantonly, mm. that's the whole thing. Now about this political ban about cow slaughter or whatever. This has many things. 
One thing is there is a sensitivity. Once you drink milk from the cow, she's like your mother. Killing your mother and eating her up is something people cannot digest in this country. Still eighty percent of the people belong to that category and they're… they're hugely… there's a huge emotion, such a emotion which because they've always been made to be docile in a certain way, they have not violently react, reacted to it. Mm. But in some places, it has happened in villages and other places, there is already a beef ban in many villages just by a norm, not by any law, mm. that you don't bring these kind of th things into the village. I am not saying you must ban it or not ban it, I am saying the sensitivities of your population, you without considering, you can't go do this blatantly. Because it is growing, it's becoming a growing business, India is becoming a major exporter of beef. Yes. That's not right. Hmm. Even if somebody ate something, it is up to them, it's their personal taste, whatever. But now you're promoting it and you're making it grow, there is serious concern, but our people don't express it. Our people don't go out on the street and not going to kill anybody because they killed a cow. So, ban is not what is needed, more education was needed rather than banning. Hmm. But you haven't spoken to what happens when faith… Faith repeatedly seems to come into conflict with individual liberty, Bo ba the banning of books. There were people killed in Paris because they were seen to have mocked, uh, uh, you know, it, the Prophet Muhammad and so on. So, so where you, does this end? Where do we stop violence and politics in the name if of you, religion? If you want that to stop, you must understand this. You're saying, today, today, it's not today. In the last two thousand years, this is the history of the world. Continuously it's happening all over the world. Suicide bombers are a new phenomenon. Well, you've forgotten about the crusades and the other things which have not been reported in history. Hundreds of millions of people have been killed in the name of God, all right? It's new to us here, but even here, uh, Thousands, hundreds and thousands have been slaughtered in northern part of India just because of the faith that they belong to when the invasions happened. Nobody writes about it because we never took the pen and wrote, somebody wrote history for us the way they like it. Because all history is sponsored by kings, they wrote the history the way they want and they said they're great emperors. But what they did was absolutely terrible. So you need to understand faith is a new thing to us. When I say new, in this country which has twelve, fifteen thousand years of uh, history behind us, thousand years is new for us, we've still not come to terms with it, we're still struggling with it. But struggling within ourselves, not creating a struggle on the street because that's not our nature because here always we've been drilled into us, whatever you do, there'll be a consequence for you. Even if you come back another life, another life, it won't leave you, it'll come back to you. This has been told, this controls people, this is, a t this is a tremendous technology, please understand this. And it's not simply a fake thing, it is a real thing. Everything that you think, feel, act, there is a consequence. Not because there is somebody thinking he must give gift, uh, give you a reward or a punishment. It happens in your own chemistry. Hmm. How do we keep faith, which you say is new to us, separate from politics? You have… you have in the past, for example, I remember when Anna Hazare was launching his anti-corruption movement, you did come and… and applaud it, but you said that the Lokpal was not some magic wand, I remember you saying that. Do you believe that we are seeing a dangerous cocktail of faith and politics getting more and more mixed up? You see, uh, it is happening, I'm not saying no, but it's much less than ever before. Really? Yes. It seems to be much more than it No, was. that's because of you. <laughs> that's because… that's because if… if ten people get beheaded in some remote part of Iraq, you make sure the blood spills into my sitting room because of that. Otherwise, you are sitting here now. Today, let's say thousand years ago we were sitting here, thousand people got killed in Iraq, we will sit here peacefully thinking world is going really <laughs> great, springtime, everything is nice. Mm. So this is because the dissemination of information, mm. if ten people get killed somewhere, it's a huge thing because it comes into our sitting rooms, bedrooms, dining room, everywhere there's a television. So it pours into our homes, so it is happening. So this is good because even a small thing looks magnified now in people's experience. But this has been happening always, it's happening at its lowest level now. 
here and there it spurts up, which need to be controlled for sure. But what I see is, for the first time, for the very first time in the history of humanity, even if you… And the numbers are not qualified because the population has increased, even in terms of percentages of people, how many people can think for themselves today is huge compared to what it was a hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago. All these centuries, there would be one man in the village who thinks for you, who reads for you, who writes for you. You just have to do what you have to do, simple things. Today everybody is able to think for himself or herself. Now, human intellect is blossoming, I do not say it is blossoming in the right direction, with the right sense, no. Insanely it is blossoming, it doesn't matter, insanity will happen for some time, people will come to their senses, when something is new they'll go crazy, after some time they'll come to senses. Once human intellect blossoms sufficiently on the planet, then this looking upward for well-being will not make sense, believe me. Right now, from looking upward, slowly the world is tilting. For in pursuit of human well-being, people were looking heavenward. Still many are, that's different. But a whole lot of people have started looking outward. So if you look heavenward, hallucinations will happen, wars will happen. Because my heaven and your heaven, different, you know. None of the heavens have anything for women, you better know that <laughs> I… I'm… I'm definitely going to hell. Anyway… Uh, so you believe in heaven and hell? I was being facetious. I was being facetious. <laughs> Let me finish this. I was being facetious. I don't know if there is That's somebody fine. up there. That is fine. Is it a force? No, I'm is saying it an energy? Is that this… this thing about me? looking heavenward is slowly going away and in pursuit of well-being, people are looking outward. This is ripping the planet apart. Human pursuit of well-being is just destroying the planet. Hmm. Now, the fundamentals of what we are transmitting, the fundamentals of this culture, which is essentially rooted in the yogic culture, what you call as Indian culture or Hindu culture, is essentially a pure yogic science. In the form of culture, it finds many colors and distortions. Hmm. which is what you are seeing as a Hindu culture or Indian culture, whatever you want to call it. But they're not interchangeable terms. Why? Because we are a multi-religious <laughs> country with many you, different I wanted, cultures. <laughs> I want you to understand the word Hindu does not signify a religion. You ask them, do they worship one god if they're Hindus? In the same family they're worshiping twenty-five gods. <laughs> they don't… they don't know which is the god, so they're making sure worship everything. Just in case, something will hit, okay <laughs> Now, the word Hindu means the land between Himalayas and Indusagara. This land, this subcontinent is Hindu. All people who are born here are considered Hindu because it's a geographical identity. I know there's a whole political issue, if I speak like this, they say, oh, he's Hindu. No, I mean, people will tell you you're echoing the RSS chief. I don't know what he said, I'm not… He said all Indians are Hindus and there was a huge okay, political I'm outcry not, over that. Okay, all Indians live between Himalayas and Indian Ocean. That's okay. Those who want to jump into the That's ocean… Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you live… Bef see, this is a dialectical culture, it expresses things in a certain way. Between Himalayas and Indian Ocean, if you live, you are a Hindu. If you jump into the ocean and cross, you are a Lanka. So, th I don't know what is the struggle about this. This is because there is such a narrow understanding of this. This is the debate we have to change in the country. Mm. Because somebody has absolute belief systems, we are trying to compare that to a culture where there is no such thing as belief. We are not ever been believers, we've always been seekers. This is a land where the highest value has never been God, always liberation, mukti. Freedom is the highest goal, God has never been the highest goal. So, you… you put this in the same box as something which just believes this is it or you're dead. Unfortunate, 
that's not the way to look at it. This is what we have to bring back. If we really value human freedom, you must bring back this seeking for liberation. I want to be free, not just from others, but from myself and my God and my heaven and everything. Because God has never been the goal in this culture. God is just another tool. When I use the word tool for a God, people get very hurt. They say, Sadhguru, don't say that, it hurts us. So that's okay. You come to the ashram, I'll give you some plumbing job, all right? <laughs> That'll so, hurt more. <laughs> no, no, no. No spanner, no winch, nothing. Use your fingers, nails, teeth, whatever. Mm. Three days later, finger, nails will be gone, half the teeth will be gone. Then I will give you a spanner. Will you worship the spanner or no? We are who we are. As, as human beings, we are who we are only because of our ability to use a tool. Mm. Otherwise, you are not even good as a dog. You can't even fight a dog, isn't it? So you're against organized religion? Quite clearly, if God is just no, a tool see, and faith no, no, is not, not the same I'm as spirituality… I'm not saying I'm against this or that. All I'm saying is, I want human beings to come to this much. If you know something, you know it. If you don't know something, you don't know it. Everything that you do not know, you believe. This is a dangerous thing. Now, the fight on the planet is not between good and evil, this and that, no. One man's belief versus another man's belief. I'm saying, why the hell do you believe anything? Because you're essentially not straight enough to admit, I really don't know. I don't know people can't fight. I don't know you don't know, can we fight? I know is a fight. I do not know is never a fight. I do not know is a way of seeking. If we do not establish this seeking in every human being, that every human being is longing to know, whether outside or inside, whatever, you are… because this is a nature of human intelligence, it can't sit quiet. It can only sit quiet if you freeze it with belief system. If you seal it with belief system, it can sit quiet. Otherwise, the very nature of this intelligence is it wants to know. Okay, we're almost at the end, so I think I'm going to take a few questions, just two, three minutes of questions. Seeing lots of hands uh, go up, the lady behind you, yes, please. Sadhguru, in uh, one of your videos, you say that uh, the problem with the world is that uh, most people lack the intensity. Huh? Most people lack the necessary intensity. Mm -hmm. And then you say the way is dhyana. So, intensity is more associated to fierceness in personality and dhyana is more associated to calmness. So, they are somehow counterintuitive. Can you elaborate a little? People think uh, peace means rest in peace <laughs> because their idea of peace is death. Peace can be very intense. Peace can be tremendously intense because peace means the reverberations of life have become subtle and intense. Action means reverberations of life are not so subtle, it is at a certain level. So peace happens not because… peace may happen if somebody is dead, but to be alive and peaceful means you need to be highly intense state of energy, otherwise you can't be peaceful. The reason why most people who don't have any problems as such, you know, after all they're trying to earn a living, uh, reproduce and bring up their children and die one day, just for that they're freaking simply because of lack of intensity. Because life is happening at a low ebb, naturally everything is a problem. If it rises a little bit, suddenly you have a little clearer view of everything. For this, you need a higher intensity of energy within you. And the yogic system is essentially focused towards that. Dhyana does not mean <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, let's take the next question uh, here, right here in the front row, yeah. What I get from Isha's philosophy, if I may say there is, is that you need to see internally, in your interiority. You need to fix it internally before fixing your external situations. But is it also not right? Is it also not very important to do the right thing externally, you know? Uh, just to make myself more clear, you know, if I be more… No, no, I am clear. I get the question. <laughs> Why do I look so dumb <laughs> <laughs> Let's say, you know, if… I got it. Yeah. Got if somebody it. is born… I got the question. 
Isha's philosophy is not about looking internally or externally, it is just that if you're looking for mangoes, you look up the tree, you don't dig the earth, all right <laughs> But if you're looking how to plant a mango tree, then you dig the earth. You're looking for mangoes if you dig the earth, will you find it, I'm asking? So if you inner things, you must look inward, outer things you must look outward. There is no such philosophy, look out or look in. Wherever the damn thing is, look there. It's like, you know, Shankar and Pillai went for a job interview <laughs> and uh, they asked him, which is further, Mumbai or Moon? He thought profoundly and then said, Mumbai. They said, how do you say this? He said, I can see the moon, I can't see Mumbai <laughs> Okay, last question, yeah. Namaskaram Sadhguru. I just want to ask… Hold the mic closer Yeah, to I just want to ask you that everybody's perception of good and bad is different. And what do you think if we start manifesting our own good and bad, what will be the state of the society? Mm, maybe you won't have power tonight <laughs> I think I already made this clear. The, the biggest problem with the world is that too many good people, not enough sensible people. Yeah. Sense is life-specific, okay? Goodness need not be life-oriented. Goodness may be going to heaven. And the moment I want you to understand this dangerous concept, people don't address this. The moment you believe, suppose I believe there is heaven and it's a beautiful place and you can live in the company of gods, should I send you there today or no? If I really care for you, I'm saying. <laughs> yes? If I really care for you and if I believe there's a great place, should I send you there or not? This is a dangerous thing, you understand? If you stretch it to its logical end, it's a really dangerous thing. The moment I believe there is a fantastic place up there, I really love you and I want you to go there, you know? <laughs> yes? Okay, let, let me just end by asking you something uh, that we haven't spoken about and then I'll hand it over to Chiki. You said you love machines. I didn't say I love them. Okay, you like I, machines, or they're useful. They work. Have our, have our lives been overtaken by gadgets? Uh, not mine. No? Definitely not. I use all the gadgets, but they don't overtake me. These are fantastic things in our life. Things… Th see, in every way, compared to how a human being was, let's say, hundred years ago, you're almost superhuman. Hundred years ago, if I could just pick up something from my pocket and talk to somebody in America right now, I would be superhuman. Why superhuman? If I said I'm God, people would have believed me. Hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, if I just had a light bulb, I would have become God on this planet. I want you to know. Look at the things we have today. We are really superhuman. Once this kind of capability has come to us, little more sense has to rise, little more awareness and consciousness to, has to arise. If this doesn't happen, this capability will turn against us. This is what you're saying. Now gadgets are freaking people. Why? It's a simple thing. You, if you want to use it, you can use it or you can keep it aside. Because you're in a compulsive state, if you start using a cell phone, you can't stop it. Even in your sleep, you're texting, see the boy is… he's in… Uh, He's not with me, he's in the, looking at me in the screen <laughs> Now, this is the same thing. If food is good, if you start eating, you don't know when to stop. If you start drinking, you don't know when to stop. If you start doing something, you don't know when to stop. The same thing, it is not about the gadget, it is not about the food, it is just that there is not enough consciousness, there is compulsiveness. Everything is happening compulsively. Instead of addressing the root, you're trying to kill the gadget, Gadget is a fantastic thing, every damn gadget has enhanced our life in a huge way, isn't it? Don't curse the gadgets, it is just that compulsiveness has to go. Well, on that note, I will say thank you for provoking us. As always, a pleasure for you. Pleasure. Let's have a big round of applause for the Sadhguru.